The Edwardian era, a period not so long ago, a little over a hundred years separate us. But in regards to fashion, we're worlds apart. <laughs> and over-the-top fashions of the Edwardian period did, however, make a turn towards our modern clothing styles, becoming more practical and sensible, particularly the fashion styles I will be sharing with you today, both of which can be created with the most ease in juxtaposition to the high fashions of the decade. <laughs> Now I will show you how to look Edwardian by dressing in the dominant fashion styles of the era and how to do it using the fewest garments possible. Also, offer you as much garment detail that I can for each item of clothing needed so that you can utilize this information when attempting to reproduce it and achieve a historically accurate Edwardian era classic look as best as you can. You don't understand, I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I want to note, for purposes of this video, the term Edwardian and its fashion looks I will be helping you reproduce should be understood as generally applying to the period between 1989 until about 1907 and when a more simple and unfastening dress came into mode. Nonetheless, the whole of the Edwardian period was a time of feminine clothing, elegant dress, tailor-made suits, shirtwaist suits, silks, trimmings, adornment, undergarments, accessories, and layers of it, a great deal of it. The fashion was globally trendsetting, and it was for the first time ever in history Americans are fashion trendsetters, being recognized as fashion leaders on an international scale. Now, the U.S. is looking to one of their very own for fashion influence and finding it in a cartoon figure known as the Gibson Girl. drawn by American illustrator Charles Dana Gibson around the 1890s, which is considered the late Victorian period. And although her structured silhouette does not come into fruition until about the Edwardian, Edwardian era, when she does secure the ideal beauty and fashion aesthetic of the era, transforming fashion for every American and many European Edwardian women. The Edwardian silhouette grew out of the late Victorian fashion aesthetic where cinched waist corsets recreated the illusion of a wasp waist, also known as the hourglass shape. This was a characteristic style that slowly began to shift at the germination of the Edwardian period with the introduction of a straight front corset or S-band corset around 1897. The straight front corset refers to the front element of the corset called a busk and it sits at the center front of the garment supporting a straight stomach line. So, the new safety corset ejected women's chest forward and hips backward into a curvy linear S shape. It created a curvy figure, a low mono bosom bust, a narrow waist, and a long deep hip. And when Edwardian styles were thrown over the top of the undergarments, it finished the look, resulting in a pigeon effect pattern companies at the time referred to this style of bodice design as powder front. Powder is a kind of pigeon able to inflate its crop and this word was used to describe the finished S silhouette look for its similarity to the bird. 
So, by the turn of the century, women are wearing the latest safety corset and it's contouring their figures into the new S shape, laying down the new body ideal and subsequently a distinct early Edwardian silhouette. It's an absolute must to aim and achieve this S shaped silhouette in order to recapture a historically accurate Edwardian style. So now that you know that the dominant Edwardian S silhouette is everything, we can start with how to attain the ideal looks we will be discussing here next. But naturally, we'll need to start with undergarments, which may seem unimportant to the modern person, but for the Edwardian woman, it was foundational. Undergarments supported a proper fit and shaped the ideal S silhouette every costume depended on. And because of it, women of this era were acquainted with several pieces of underwear. As much as 15 staple pieces, more or less, were available, and many of which came in different styles. For example, the petticoat. It came in long, short, princess styles, and more. down to at least three predominant pieces known to have been worn by all Edwardian women, although more were usually worn. But for the styles that we will be recreating today in this video, the following undergarments are suitable. Number one, the combination suit. This is a one-piece undergarment that combines the chemise, a loose-fitting undergarment, and drawers. I can never pronounce that word, aka underpants into one garment. The primary purpose of the chemise was to protect the corset from direct contact with the body and wick away any moisture. Secondarily, it helped to keep the bosom well arranged and properly covered atop the corset, but the attached drawers, aka knickers, or pantaloons about 1902 and 1906 had a wide frilly leg, open crotch seams, usually front facing with the mother of pearl closure, and it could be cut from fine or plain cottons. It was considered a practical garment that helped reduce any volume at the waist. There also exists the traditional separate chemise and drawers and is acceptable when recreating these looks because they too are or would be historically accurate. Number two, the corset. The safety or S-band, a term more commonly used as is the straight front corset, has too many names really. This was an essential structural undergarment of the Edwardian era, although considered more a support garment rather than underwear. And it was an underbust corset that existed in an incredible variety of styles, materials, and finishes. There was one to suit almost every occasion. The underbust corset did not independently give the bust support, shape, or lift in the way that other overbust corsets do. So please do consider this important detail when fitting a corset for Edwardian recreation. Number three, a petticoat. This is a type of lingerie worn under a skirt or dress. Most petticoats were extremely embellished with flounce, yet smooth and made from taffeta. But not only, however, taffeta was the most commonly worn under practical dress. Petticoats are much more complex in design and function than I described. Truly, all the garments of this era are, but implement any one of these details I mentioned and you'll be right on track. <laughs> the undergarments and lingerie material was dependent on the purpose for which it was used, so it's hard to narrow down the exact type, but really white cotton fabrics for plain and sturdy types, while delicate fabrics or semi sheer cotton, batiste, even lawn were the preferred style, but the former is most accurate for our looks today. Stockings, too, were made from silk and lyle and held up by garters, often attached to the corset. Sometimes just by a simple tie of the ribbon around the leg could be found. They were also made in a variety of colors, whereas undergarments were made in soft light pastel colors, including white. So do not skip undergarments. It's critical to building the base an Edwardian silhouette requires.
Oh, and undergarments should be worn onto the body in the order in which I mentioned them. So combination suit, corset, and petticoat. Now let's begin with recreating the most influential Edwardian look adopted by all social classes. It was constructed to help meet the practicalities of a growing class of working women during a period of great technological advances and social changes occurring for modernization. And it was the notable new and modern two-piece garment that came in the form of a tailor-made. It was in vogue and in favor more than any style of the time. The Gibson girl style was considered haute couture by Edwardians. The cartoon characters' fashions captured the new woman's look, and that was embroidered blouses, shirt collar waists worn with either a tie, a floppy bow, cravat, even brooches, as well as different styles of jabots. Together with the new day skirt style, which flared smoothly over the hips and gradually widened at the hemline, many catalog pattern making companies and homemakers attempting to recreate the new Gibson girl look, a style that was taking on a new importance in society and being adapted by every social class, bore embellished ornate reproductions from it, putting into motion a variety of shirt waist suit styles like the heavily nine gourd skirt, for example. This occurred because status was equated to excess, meaning the more you had, the higher your social status. Shirtwaists were elaborately designed with tucks, yokes, fullness over the bust, column necklines, gathers, Lego mutton sleeves, while skirts were gored, sometimes up to nine of them were employed, flared with sweep and typically of round length, just clearing the floor. So fabrics like linen skirts, silk mohair skirts, both could be trimmed with embroidery, lace, and were strongly admired. Okay, so let's move on to accessories and accessorizing the Edwardian way. An Edwardian lady never left the house without gloves in the winter, but also in the summer. A bit excessive? Well, it was the Edwardian way. Short gloves were available mostly for street gowns and they were all dressed very elaborately, designed to impress, and often made in silk, but also other materials like suede and velvet were common, and they were often covered in the finest embroidery, maybe lace, even plain, but were colored in white or pale. Biscuit shades too were chiefly seen, though black was common as well. Hats and feathers, <laughs> where to start? There were so many styles. In fact, it deserves a video of its own, but I'll only talk of the most fashionable and iconic hat of the time. It was characterized by its brimmed style. The top was decorated with flowers, greenery, ribbons, tulle, pearls, and sometimes all at the same time. Oh, and the feathers, often ostrich, but not only, and I'm sorry to say, stuffed birds. I know, I know, but it's the sad truth. <laughs> now, bags or purses, the term you and I are familiar with today, they were not in use. Instead, a small decorative bag that hung off the wrist, if at all, was worn. Makeup was minimal. Face powder that came in a few colors, including white, and rouge that came in pots and would be applied to the cheeks, lips, eyes, if at all, because a natural face was of the mode. And since we've touched on the subject of makeup, then this is a good time to touch on hair, because what is hair without makeup? Except a 1920s ideal, which we will be touching on later in the future. It was a specific upswept hairstyle called a cottage low, and it was very, very popular. Women everywhere piled their hair up 
right on the top of their head in a circular shape which created lots of volume around the perimeter of the hairstyle. Now, there were many variations of the cottage loaf hairstyle as well as other hairstyles like the pompadour hairdo. But for an accurate depiction of the cottage loaf style, look to the Gibson Girl illustrations. It'll give you an accurate depiction of what was attempted to be recreated by Edwardian women. Next up, the parasol. This is my favorite accessory because it's rich with history. But the parasol is under no circumstances to be confused for an umbrella. It completed the Edwardian look, a beautiful extension of the costume, a timeless accessory, decorative and lush. It was an Edwardian sign of beauty. If you don't have a parasol, then I recommend a silk laced fan. They too were a demure handheld accessory. Shoes. Lattice strap pumps were common, laced up boots which continued on from the Victorian era and many other styles were available too, like the Oxford shoe with a Cuban heel and an elbow toe and they were worn together with stockings or hose and it was an important feature that both were to match in color shoes and hose. Now for the overcoat, cloaks, mantelets, pelisse, running coats, palatots, boas, whatever you got, <laughs> all were worn over the dress and these are some of the various styles found during the Edwardian era. So do wear any one of these and you'll be ready to walk out the door as a perfect Edwardian woman of the era. <laughs> As for the color palette, the popular colors and shades were often soft pastels like rose, lilac, mauve, cream, ivory, but also some very bright, vivid colors like red and green, for example, were in use, but they didn't make up the dominant palette of the era. The dominant shades were typically light and feminine. However, colors black and gray were available and could be found also in gloves, shoes, boas, and cloaks. The shirtwaist suit tops were white, cream, drab, neutral color tops, and dark colored skirts. The color palette fit practical uses um, of the shirtwaist suit. The clothing combinations for this decade include lots of single tones and contrasting colors. So this pretty much sums it up. If you are still in need of more visual inspiration, I recommend looking to media publications of the era, art, icons such as Camille Clifford, Lily Alsey, the Gibson Girl uh, illustrations, Evelyn Nesbitt. The big takeaway I would like for you to leave here with is that the dominant Edwardian look was putting together a two-piece that was finished in the S-shaped silhouette. Now these fashion looks were also designed for functionality which was still in its infancy during this time. But no trousers please, they are definitely out of question. <laughs> women are not wearing them, although by the end of the 19th century women did begin to appear in public wearing toned down bloomers and knickers for bike riding and other sports. But by no means was this the dominant fashion of the Edwardian era. But it is yet to come. <laughs> so remember that the Edwardian period demonstrates a society's turn to modernization and many women did dress accordingly. So if you still have any questions on the mind on how to achieve the Edwardian look, please do leave me your questions down in the comment section below because I would love to answer them. Thank you for being here everyone and we'll see you again next week. Bye!